All right, welcome to noon conference, everybody. We'll get started. Um, for those of you that are logged in virtually, if you could join Poll EV, um, but feel free to chat as well, and we'll get to your questions. And I have a few people here at the VA with me today as well. Hopefully, more are coming. Cool. Uh, we'll have another basics lecture today, uh, which was requested by one of our residents. Um, and so we're going to be talking about AFib, um, talk about some initial outpatient workup, which sometimes you will have to do inpatient if it's a new AFib admission, navigate the inpatient decompensations, and then we'll review some um, evidence-based uh, literature for AFib. So as always, uh, we're going to do a primer. Today we're back to the echoes. Um, and so if you guys want to click on which chambers you think are abnormal, you guys want to tell me what you think is going on here? Yeah, good. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting some good clicks here. So um, one of our students here said the atria are very enlarged, and that's correct. So on this view, with it, which is the apical four-chamber view done laterally from the chest, um, on any cardiac ultrasound, just to remind you, the uh, pointer or the um, little marker should be on the right of the screen, of the ultrasound screen. Um, and so this is closest to the skin. And then we're looking deeper in, so the atria would be the furthest away in the apical four-chamber view. Um, up here is the left ventricle. Here's the right ventricle. And so these are the atria, which are very enlarged and are bigger than the ventricles, which is abnormal. All right, so for our case today, we have a 55-year-old man. He's presenting to your clinic with palpitations. And that's all I'm gonna give you today. And I want you guys to tell me what chief complaint specific questions you would ask. And so we're gonna stay away from generic, like what medical problems do you have? And ask about the palpitations. Um, yeah, he's having some dyspnea on exertion. Yeah, so um, they sort of happen like once or twice a day, and it's been happening now almost every day for the last two weeks. Mm, sometimes he feels dizzy. And then he does uh, not have any chest pain, but he does have exertional dyspnea. Change his habits in any way recently? Just drinking more no, no more caffeine. No syncope, no loss of consciousness, no recent signs of blood loss. And you just said no chest pain. Palpitation. That includes like radiation from the chest. Say that again. You said no chest pain. Yeah, no, no pain really Maybe anywhere. Like other torso pain? No torso pain. Has he felt this before? He has not felt this before. It started two weeks ago. Um, yeah, he really is not on any meds at all. Any vision changes? No vision changes. Some dizziness, like I said. Is it like constant or is it come and go? No, it comes and goes. It happens once or twice a day. He thinks it happens more if he's being active uh, with his shortness of breath. But then it goes away, but it's not happening every day. Does it feel irregular or just like? He can't tell. He just feels like his heart is beating fast. Um, is it a, yeah, so it's somewhat associated with exercise. He can't tell you if it's associated with stress. And then it's intermittent, and the triggers are, are possibly activity, but it can happen if he's just sitting as well. All right, any last questions? Those are really great. Um, he doesn't think so. No, that's all fine. Yeah, one pillow. Amanda, the chief complaint is palpitations. Okay. Yep. And so, good. You guys did a great job. So, um, I'll tell you, we already talked about some of this. So. 
it's happening every day. It's once or twice a day. Um, he sometimes feels dizzy. Um, he has exertional dyspnea. Um, of note, he's a longtime smoker, 40 packer history. He says he drinks one to two drinks per night, which would have been important to ask about, right? Um, and so this is what you know about him now. So this is an outpatient setting. And so in a time limited setting, what are your next steps in clinic? Okay, yeah, great. That's great. We'll get an EKG. What else? Yes, like a TSH. A B N N P. Okay. Tell me why you want a B N P. Um Atria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Um, Claire, tell us why. Um, just to see if he's anemic, and then you know, with palpitations, I would check for a TSH. Yeah. Awesome. And so CBC and a TSH. We want a BNP. We want vitals. Yeah. Awesome. So you know, of course, in clinic, you're gonna do an exam, right, to see how you may drive your care. So yeah, those are all good things. Say it again, a UA. Uh, not, sorry, okay, you're in Great, awesome. You guys are doing a really good job here. Encourage alcohol cessation, see if that helps. Yeah, Anita, that's a great point. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Did you ever like, get an Yeah. That's a good question. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so, um, so you started with an exam. Here are his vitals. He is obese, um, his HENT exam is okay. I'm gonna read the rest of it for you. I'll let you guys take a look at this. A little bit low, okay, on the oxygen, yeah. And as always, what exam may be missing from this in a patient with palpitations? What exam is, do you think may be missing from what I've given you? And something that Dr. Bricks had mentioned earlier. Capriville is normal. Pulses are okay. Amanda, did you say something? Uh, like, is there edema? Oh, it's a edema. No edema. Thyroid exam, yeah, Anita, great. So thyroid exam is good. You know, there's sometimes people have like these toxic nodules um, and we're gonna get a TSH anyway, but you may be more inclined to get a TSH even at on a, a free T4 if you felt something in the thyroid. So make sure you're doing thyroid exams for these patients. Okay. And then you wanted the EKG, right? So here's the EKG. Um, can one of our students read this EKG for us since we had our EKG TDL already? So this person is appears to be in the normal size right now. Left happy, like maybe on the more gravy side. Um, there is no axis deviation. The P waves look a little peaked. Um, looking at plate two. Wait, was that echo that we saw earlier? This patient? No. Oh, okay. But this patient also has um, peaked P waves. Um, Normal heart rate progression. I don't know if I see anything in normal. It just kind of looks like the really confused. Okay, um, what do the peaked P waves tell you? Peaked P waves can be like atrial dysfunction, like atrial overload, like uh, hypertrophic changes in the atrium, things like that. <laughs> Yeah, great. So um, the read here, which was excellent, was that if we do rate rhythm axis and then um, interval segments, uh, the rate is normal, if not a little bit brady. Um, the rhythm is normal sinus, P before every QRS and a QRS after every P. 
the axis is normal. Um, the biggest amplitude are both upright in one and two and positive in F. Um, the intervals is no PR prolongation. The QRS is narrow. The ST looks okay. And the um, QT looks okay. There are no ST segment elevations or depressions, right? And then um, our Victor really astutely pointed out that he thinks that the P waves in lead two look a little bit pointed, which they do, which may be a sign of some right heart strain or right atrial enlargement. Good. Okay, so then moving on, um, you decide that this patient uh, will go home and they'll get some labs. Um, something that you all did not mention yet was getting a monitor, right? And so we can talk a little bit about that. And then an echocardiogram. So Dr. Glickman mentioned, um, should this patient get an echo? And that's a great question. Um, in patients that we're evaluating for palpitations, Young, otherwise healthy people, you can do just an EKG in clinic and get up and get, set them up with a Holter monitor. Or when I say Holter monitor, you set them up with a continuous cardiac monitor and we'll talk about what all the options are that are available. But in patients like this patient who's a little bit older in age, he had hypertension on his vitals, um, he has a long history of COPD, um, and with the exertional dyspnea, you may be concerned that he has structural heart disease, right? These are the patients that sometimes have had silent MIs or have um, coronary artery disease. And so um, patients who fall in that category, you should consider getting an echocardiogram to both evaluate for valvular disease, as well as uh, wall motion abnormalities and other structural heart disease. And then um, just to go over the different options for continuous uh, rhythm monitoring are one, the Holter monitor, which this is. And it a, looks a, like a pretty cumbersome device. You have to wear these leads all day with you. Uh, but the Holter monitor is only on the patient for 24 to 48 hours. So really maximum 48 hours. You're not allowed to shower with it. And so you really don't want to go beyond that um, with your daily life. But you can put this on go to work, just go about your life, um, and you can click the button if you're feeling uh, symptoms. A Zeo patch, which you guys may have heard of, um, is a lot sleeker, um, just goes on your chest, but this device is used for a longer period of time, um, two weeks up to a month. There's literature, which I didn't present here, that suggests that uh, longer term event monitors pick up more abnormalities. And so in this patient, since he's having symptoms every day, which option would you choose? Holter. Yeah. So in this patient, you just need short term monitoring. But there are patients that have uh, palpitations that are pretty sporadic. And so in somebody like that, you may want to pick a ZO patch. And then lastly, um, here I'm showing you an implantable loop monitor. Um, and so these actually get implanted into the patient. And these are very long-term monitors, um, up to three years usually. Some people have them in forever, really. And so it looks like the bottle you're getting is probably, or you're getting multiple, or like, um, you're Yeah, it's like a mini leads, yeah. Not, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's some of that information for you. <clears throat> Anything that jumps out in the labs? Nope. Yeah, pretty good. I said get a pregnancy test if this were a woman. Perhaps not if they're 55, but you can never know because um, palpitations are a common presenting symptom of pregnancy. Um, and then a UTOX, as Dr. Glickman mentioned earlier, if you suspect drug use. All right, and then I posted a fake report for y'all, but his report said that there was 34% of the time the patient seems to be in atrial fibrillation with a maximum heart rate of 160. Otherwise, the patient is in normal sinus rhythm. Does this come as a surprise to anybody? No, yeah. All right, so um, not a moving image, but the echocardiogram of this patient does show some right atrial enlargement, which we picked up earlier on the EKG. Um, this, is an, this is a slightly skewed image, so you're not seeing the full chambers there on the left side. Again, the marker here is on the right on the ultrasound screen. All right, so um, the patient, patient representation here that I gave you guys is that 55-year-old man, with palpitations, found to have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. 
which we are presuming is due to structural heart disease because he has structural heart disease on his echo. Um, I didn't post this here, but on his echo, he also had um, some decreased EF to 40%. So based on our previous talk on heart failure, does this person have congestive heart failure? It's 40%. Dante says yes. Does everybody agree? I agree with Dante. You agree with Dante. Okay. So you guys remember we talked earlier about <laughs> heart failure is a clinical diagnosis, right? And um, yes, you could say maybe the dyspnea is related to his heart failure, but he had no crackles. We didn't don't, don't have an extra here, but he had no edema. And so, you know, one could say that he doesn't really have clinical signs of heart failure. So just remember low ejection fraction doesn't necessarily equal heart failure. Diastolic dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean diastolic heart failure. You have to have clinical sy symptoms as well, okay? And so Dante, Dr. Mesa can of course argue with me that he thinks that dyspnea is a symptom and therefore this patient has heart failure and I'm cool with that. That's why we're here and that's what medicine is. All right, so we're gonna get into some management. So you're this patient's PCP. Um, Okay, so fall. So you guys are not ready to put this patient on flaconide and call it a day. Tell me why. I mean, I think like off the bat, um, I mean, we never have such a job. But like, rate control is, you know, uh, is just as good as rhythm control. Generally, there are some nuances to that. I think also with it, someone being relatively young and um, it being like their first diagnosis, like I think probably you would argue that let's try like, um, let's try hydrating him and see if he does okay with that. Um, but, you know, regardless if you're gonna do like a trial of, if you're gonna try cardioverting him or just rate controlling him, I wouldn't do a medical purpose. Okay, great. Um, so Dr. Brixton here was saying that in um, younger patients, it may be worthwhile to consider cardioversion to see if they'll stay in normal sinus rhythm. Um, Dr. Brixton, knowing his echo, would you think that cardioversion will remain successful? I, I think like less likely, just given the large size of his uh, RA, but I'm also a little worried about like his lower EF, even if we're not having a heart failure, and where it could be bradycardia induced. Okay. I don't think would make me want it. Um, you know, I still think like rate control would um, be important, but it's just like, I think, I still think rate control would be useful probably, but just like I said, it would still be important to rate control in his face. Yeah. Um, with that as well. Great. So great. So this is great. This is always the debate in new onset AFib or first discovery of AFib is should we just cardiovert this patient out of it? And like Dr. Brixen is mentioning, so a young healthy patient, you should consider doing that. In this patient, the low, the decreased EF, the structural problems with his atrium, all based on data suggests that his success rate with cardioversion will be in the 40 to 50% range and that he's likely to bounce back into AFib. And so for him, um, we're gonna try to we're gonna decide on rate control, okay? And so I um, brought up this article for you guys. So the Affirm trial is a really big trial. It had about four thousand people um, randomized controlled them and looked at rate versus rhythm control, and rate control was essentially non inferior. Um, and the rhythm control group, in fact, had more. Um, symptomatic side effects because the rhythm control drugs are prorhythmic themselves, right? So that's the conundrum that you're dealing with. Um, and so we're going to pick rate control. All right, so we're with rate control. You're just going to maximally up titrate that metope to target a heart rate of 60. Race two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Mesa is quoting the race two trial. Tell me what, tell me what that trial did. Uh, well, Victor knows about the race two trial as well. <laughs> Victor, Victor, tell us what you He's know. Like, oh man, so many acronyms. Um, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the race well, two was. I think that the race two. Isn't this where you need to keep the heart rate under one hundred? Yeah, versus. Versus. Yeah. 
Good. Anita also got that right up there. So. <laughs> Go, Anita! Strong work, everybody. All right, so race two had fewer patients, about 400 patients in this trial, and they looked at lenient control with a rate of 110 versus strict control, which is a rate of 80. And these are rates with a um, six minute walk test. So, you know, don't just go off with a rest rate, make them exercise just a bit to see what happens. And you want the rate to be less than 110. And again, the strict control people just had more side effects, they had more dizziness, syncope, et cetera, because you're really maximally giving them a lot of beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, which is not um, great. Cool. And then, um, so we talked about rhythm versus rate. And then the last thing that we always talk about with atrial fibrillation is anticoagulation, right? And so um, how do we figure out if somebody needs anticoagulation when they have atrial fibrillation? <laughs> yeah, good, good. So, <laughs> um, all right. So in the past, so how do we decide who we anticoagulate? Right? We don't anticoagulate anti everybody. And so in the past, there used to be just the CHADS-2 score. Then um, the Swedish decided to come up with a new score, which is the one we use now, which is the CHADS-2 BASC score. Um, and in a more like a ton of patients they tested, the CHADS-2 BASC is a lot of a better um, estimate of stroke risk than just the CHADS. And so that's why we use this score now. Um, here are um, just a comparison of the two scores and then here are the stroke risks per year with your CHADS2 VAS score going up. In an elderly patient um, that has bleeding risks, what score do we use to compare to the CHADS2 VAS? Has blood. Has blood, yes. <laughs> and I didn't write I didn't write this, I didn't bring that up in the presentation here, but it's important in a patient that may have a bleeding complication or has had bleeding in the past. What we do is we use the has bled score, H A S dash bled, and you compare and that'll like pump out a risk of bleeding for you, and then you get their CHAD score. And that'll pump out a risk of stroke. And whichever risk is higher, you can decide to go without anticoagulation or for anticoagulation. Make sure that we're having these conversations with the patient and so their opinion also matters. Yeah, I'll add, yeah. Uh, our, our brains will always weight the error of commission as something to avoid more than the error of omission. And so this comes up all the time when we talk about, hey, we have a patient who falls, they're here with falls. Um, and they also have a kid, and we have to decide what we're going to do about the anticoagulation. Our brains will want us to not give anticoagulation because we know that if we give them the anticoagulation and they fall on these weeks, we're going to feel bad about that. That's an error of commission, something you do that causes somebody to have a negative outcome. The error of omission is when there's something we should do, but we don't do it, and that causes a bad thing. And those aren't as ready in our minds as the errors of commission are. So our brain will weight us. And so it's really important that we use the has blood even if someone comes in and they bled. Mm -hmm. Because that you can do the score and you'll see it points out that, that our brains are really subject to this weighting of things. And like we never see, or it's more rare that we see the error of omission. In other words, like we don't know how many um, strokes we presented. We don't see those, right? We see the people who come back with the bleed, but yeah. that's statistically less common than the than the thing that we prevented by doing the commission. Does that make sense? So it's just really important to check yourself on those things. And I like that framework of there of commission versus omission, and really asking yourself like which thing is the worst thing, um, and why does my brain try to convince me? Like, in which ways am I biased? Got it. So yeah. Dr. Mann, for those of you virtually, was just mentioning this idea of an error of commission versus omission, and which is, you know, both make us feel bad. So one is, if this patient's going to bleed, I give them anticoagulation and I make them bleed, that's an error of commission, and that makes us feel guilty that I caused the bleed, versus 
well, I'm worried that they're going to bleed. I'm not going to give them anticoagulation. And then you miss a stroke that they had um, later on, right? So that's an error of omission. And so just thinking about in which ways we're biased when we do medicine and making sure that we're using all the tools we have, like the HASBLAD and the CHADS to head to head compare um, how we're going to take care of the patient. Thank you, Dr. Mann. Yeah. All right. So, um, so outpatient, you got all those numbers back. Um, you decide to send the patient home on Matop sucks. You're going to titrate that with him. Um, you give him a cardiology referral for a left heart cath as an ischemic eval. Um, and then you're going to get some PFTs because of his smoking history and his right atrial enlargement. So you're doing some good PCP things here. Five years later, the ED calls you to admit a 60-year-old man with HEFREF, AFib on anticoagulation, um, who's here uh, with RVR. So his diseases have progressed. Now he has full-blown heart failure. <laughs> um, and he ended up on anticoagulation somewhere in between because it's Chad's VASC went up when he was diagnosed with CHF. Um, and so you started him on uh, whatever DOAC you wanted. So in the ED, they say they cardioverted him um, and they're admitting him to you. So what do you guys think are some common reasons that um, AFib decompensates? So... Volume status. Volume yeah. status, yep. Substances. Substances, what kind of substances? Substances. Sepsis. Sepsis. Oh, <laughs> sepsis <laughs> is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Infection, yes, Anita agrees with sepsis. OSA, yeah, worsening lung function in general can cause your atrium to get bigger and bigger. Yeah, now maybe his thyroid is whacked out. Okay. Yes, medication non-compliance. What else? Substances. Substances. <laughs> Which substances, Victor? Yeah, good. So alcohol use. Okay. And withdrawal, cocaine, meth, all of those um, sympathomimetics will make AFib worse. Yeah, you guys, I think you got them all, so good job. All right, so this patient's here. Turns out he's going through a divorce. I know, it's very sad. Yes, um, he was drinking heavily the two days prior to our arrival, and he can't remember if he took any of his meds. And so now we have both a substance issue and a med non-compliance problem. Well, he's not non-compliant. He's just, he's sad. All right. So Dr. Um, Anita Mutgal is um, on with us. And um, she is going to go through some of these cross-cover scenarios. Anita, are you there? Yes. yes. Oh, my volume's low. You're there, I heard you, okay. Okay, good. Okay, cool. So you ready? Here's scenario one. The RN calls you RVR of 140, and the BP is 60 over 40. The patient's somnolent. Anita, tell us your clinical reasoning, your thought process, and what you would do. Um, so his vital signs are not stable in the setting of... Um, this rapid heart rate, and so um, he needs to be cardioverted. Good. Um, that's excellent. That's the correct answer. <laughs> um, some people will tell you that there's just a little bit of um, jargon here. Cardioversion is usually a term we use in, use in patients that are you know, fairly stable. We have time to sedate them. We have time to really pick our jewels and um, all that jazz. Some people will say we are defibrillating them, um, even though it may be synchronized defibrillation, right? So, um, correct. Okay, good. Anita, you saved that patient. Night number two. Again, RVR 140, and here are this person's vitals. What would you like to do? So, I would just like look at his. Um, like to, to do a good like volume exam, um, just to see, because usually if they're volume overloaded, they could benefit with some diuresis to see if that helps, versus if they're 
volume down, they might need some fluids. Um, and just depending on that, you can push some metope. Awesome. And tell me what, what uh, sort of metope you would choose. IV um, versus PO. What are your thoughts? I would do IV um, metope 5. And you can, I think, do that up to three times. Yeah. Um, to see if that helps. So um, one of our residents here wanted to do 25 of PO metope. Um, tell me what you think about that. Um, I think that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah, so okay. So um, the scenarios are getting harder as we move on. So um, here, the patient is stable, they're awake, their blood pressure is like, if anything, hypertensive. And so you have an option, you can choose the piomatope. It's gonna take a while to kick in, but if they're staying stable and their pressure stays okay, you can try and do the PO route. A lot of people will choose to do the first dose uh, of Metope as IV and starting with five milligrams of IV metoprolol, And you can concomitantly give them a PO dose that then you can repeat. And so while the PO is kicking in, the IV can take care of the heart rate for you in the more immediate setting if you wanna alleviate this patient's symptom of palpitations. So either option is okay, uh, but I think uh, most of us would pick the IV option. Um, all right. So the last one. All right, Anita. This patient's pre-RVR blood pressure was 130 over 70. Now it's 106 over 64. And they are feeling palpitations, but they're awake. And so tell me what you think about this scenario. So it's like, like obviously his vital signs are changed with this like new change in heart rate. But again, I would say the vitals are like stable. Um, I mean, it's like kind of tough. I think you can do um, like IV metope or you can consider cardioverting as well. I mean, it, I think it just depends on like the like patient scenario. Let me put this in the context of somebody that is currently also here with um, heart failure exacerbation. Okay, so I think in that case, then you'd want to, then he, the patient would benefit from some diuresis with like close monitoring of his vital signs. Okay, and would you do diuresis alone with this rate or would you want to control the rate somehow? Um, also control the rate. Okay, and how are you going to do that? Are you going to give him a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker? No, probably not. Because like you don't, if he's in decompensated heart failure, that would make it worse. Good. So what option do you have? Um, I guess at that point, you would cardiovert. Yeah, your co-senior residents are whispering amiodarone, which is great. And then what else? There's a secret option as well. Yes, digoxin. Good. So um, this is the toughest scenario that we face. Anita, thank you for... Yeah, Hoda, good. Um, and yeah, these are some tough cases and you did a great job. Thank you for walking us through your clinical reasoning. And so this is the toughest scenario, but actually the most common scenario that we face in the hospital. And this happens all the time. Patients come in with a multitude of complaints, problems. They have decompensated heart failure. They also have sepsis. So you don't know if their volume up or down. Um, it's super confusing. And in a scenario like this, the question you're asking yourself is, is the blood pressure a result of the RVR or is the RVR just there as a bystander and some other process is going on? So I'm gonna show you guys a flow chart here in just a second, but the way to think through this is correct. So if this patient had no structural heart disease and no heart failure, even in this scenario, it would be okay to try to push some AV nodal blockade. So metoprolol or beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Again, only in patients that have heart, don't have heart failure or structural heart disease. You can still do the blocking. I would encourage you to stay at the bedside and make sure that the code card or the uh, defibrillator is nearby because if you mistakenly go give them those drugs and the pressure drops even further and they remain in RVR, then the next step is to cardiovar or defibrillate them. Um, so remain at the bedside if you're giving that patient um, DILT or Matope.
Then if the patient, like in this patient scenario, has heart failure or structural heart disease, you're concerned that you might exacerbate those problems, then the option that we have is amiodarone. And so you're gonna quote unquote load amio. Most of these patients at this point need to be in the ICU. And so you're gonna give them 150 of amio bolus, and then you can do another bolus um, and then start a drip. Um, and all of these orders you can talk with your pharmacist about. If the patient had a history of using amiodarone and had amiotoxicity or are allergic or whatever reason you don't want to use amio, digoxin is your last option to give these patients. Um, I've done that once. Digoxin dosing is very complicated um, and so make sure you're talking to your pharmacist um, and help and get their help to dose the digoxin drip. It also is a drip. What questions do you guys have about this scenario? Yeah, I've, I've been in that situation where they blow us blood pressure and you're like, this is our VR. And I mean, it's, it's just tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. And I don't think I have a good answer for you in determining whether it's the AFib or it's their underlying condition. And it's sort of your judgment of having taken care of that patient for the last few days that helps you decide like, okay, did I make, so we had a patient that we made NPO for like three days in a row, hoping for vascular surgery to take them to the <laughs> OR. And they like surgery kept getting pushed. And then um, they're rolling the patient to the, the pre-op area and he goes into AFib with RVR with a heart rate of 140. So then he got admitted to the ICU uh, and we were up there wondering, well, is this, you know, is this a problem of hypovolemia or is it just his AFib that's making him hypotensive? So um, we gave him a bolus um, and then started him on amio and Turned out all he needed was the bolus because he was hypovolemic. Um, and we turned the amnio off in like five hours. Okay. So um, I made this up for you guys. It's just like my version of how I think about it, which is that whenever I see a patient in AFib with RVR, if they're hemodynamically unstable, you're just going to shop them out of it, right? If they're not, then you can go down this algorithm and you're gonna go left and right. You're gonna think about, okay, is there underlying problem that they don't have enough preload um, and their heart is trying to compensate with tachycardia and ended up in AFib? Um, and so for all of these conditions, you're gonna think about giving a bolus um, as fast as you can. If that's not the case, then it's the other way, which is that does the patient have massive hypervolemia? And like Dr. Mudgal mentioned, um, for hypervolemia, you're gonna wanna diurese the patient, but remember that diuresis works slowly, much more slowly than giving fluids does. And so of course you're gonna dose them with the Lasix, but at the same time, you need to think about how am I gonna control their rate or how am I gonna control their rhythm? And so with those, then you're gonna go down this way and think about, okay, if the pressure is okay, I can do beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, easy. If the pressure is softer, but like I mentioned, no heart problems can still do those meds. But if the pressure is softer and they have heart problems, then amio or dig is our go-to, but use amio first. Um, and then remember, if you're not sure and the patient is in the ICU and they're somewhat tenuous and you are not sure if they're gonna be able to tolerate the beta blocker or not, you can always use Esmolol which is a much shorter acting beta blocker and you can turn that drip off right away if they seem hypotensive or further hypotensive. Okay, um, and as always, I wanted to, well, not as always, um, as I have started recently to talk about healthcare disparities. Um, so for atrial fibrillation, um, there are fewer studies with this, but, um, it is known that black patients are less likely to be aware that they have AFib. And when they do have AFib, they're less likely to be treated with warfarin. And this is from the REGARDS study. And the odds ratio, as you can see, are pretty shocking, less than half. And then um, they don't have enough, or like no one studied this, or they don't have enough data about um, what the disparities are, or if any exist um, in ablations. And so, if any of you are interested in cardiology, it would be interesting to see um, if the rates of ablation are different in our different populations. And then remember, I've been, um, and then uh, ischemic stroke and heart failure hospitalization rates as um, outcomes of AF are also worse in racial minorities.
So remember, like I was saying in my cirrhosis talk, is that it's important for us to uh, improve our communication skills um, and really use patient-centered languages for these complex disease processes that our patients are experiencing. Um, interestingly, um, the black population has overall lower rates of AFib than um, white patients um, when you control for heart failure um, in both populations. And so they're doing some genetic studies to see why that may be the case. Okay, so um, these are the things we talked about today. I wanted to give you guys one piece of self-directed learning, hot, hot off the presses, October 1st of this year, which is that um, this trial out of Germany uh, reports that early rhythm control therapy in patients with AFib may be better. And this is something that Dr. Brixen was mentioning earlier. I encourage you guys to look up this article and read about it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, interestingly, I like scrolling all the way down. Um, and in my last journal club, one of the interns had asked um, whether pharma companies like sponsoring these trials skews how I look at the trials. And in this one, I'm not gonna lie, you guys, like the first author has a couple patents for um, things that we use to ablate AFib. Um, and I think, you know, like you have to think about are there like personal biases that this person is coming in with uh, to do this trial. There's a meta-analysis looking at a firm and its cousin and like cousins and like all those trials suggest that rate control is just as good if not better than rhythm control strategies. This is looking more at ablations of course, but again you have to think about you know what is going to be the burden of procedures, cost, time, re-entrance into AFib and having to do another procedure and so thinking about all of those things. Yeah. But I also think these like over kind of like overweight like um fewer cardiovascular outcomes compared to like the complications of the procedures. Like I think they tend to like weight that more heavily than like bleeding and other things and like being in the hospital and stuff. But, yeah. Um, I haven't yet talked to any cardiologists about this trial. Would love to hear their opinion and whether this is practice changing, um, which is why I'm putting this at the end and not at the beginning. Um, cool. Just a plug for our YouTube channel. And um, if you guys have any questions, comments, I'm happy to take them. Thanks for including the health disparities. You're welcome. I have only seen AFib once for thyroid, which was in a young woman who was like in a thyroid storm. <laughs> so have you guys seen thyroid related AFib? Just once, yeah. No, I don't think it's <laughs> I don't think it's very common. <laughs> Alcohol related is common. Oh, and one thing I didn't talk about is um AFib is really common in during and after dialysis so if you like if you get called from dialysis that your patient's an afib if their pressure is okay you don't really have to do much about it if they're afib after dialysis um and if the pressure is okay you don't have to do much about it they'll they'll come out of it yeah all right thank you